we are, how, how, how non-embarrassing we are, <laughs> and no. Do you know which class you're talking about? <laughs> <laughs> we're tickled, that, we're tickled that, that Lori and Jill got a chance to come in and, and participate in adult class. This is really, honestly now, this is probably the first time in 20 years, 30 38, Jimmy. <laughs> Long yeah. time. Long time. And that's always been one of my pet peeves. It really has. We shouldn't get so entrenched in our service that we don't have the opportunity to rotate folks around and give them a chance. So, there. Glad to have you here. Really are. Okay? All right. All of you, I think, have been through at least the first part of this. We're going through the Sermon on the Mount. We started with the Beatitudes. I hope uh, for your benefit, the Beatitudes cover Christ's announcement of his new kingdom. And these, the Beatitudes, these are the characteristics and conditions that the citizens of this new kingdom should possess. A hungering and a thirst for righteousness, a realization of what sin is and what we must do to confront it and who has the power and authority to confront it. That's, that's what the citizen is required to have. That's the inward things in the relationship to Christ, the new king. Now, let's put this in context. We're getting ready to get in, into a little bit more of it here. The Jews of the day were expecting a new kingdom. The Jews of the day were expecting a Messiah. So a coming Messiah was not something that was revolutionary to them. They had been praying for it. They had been expecting it. They had great desire for it. So their expectation, however, was focused on what the rabbis, the teachers, the priests of the day, the spiritual leaders of the day, and for hundreds of years had begun to focus them on what that leader was going to look like, what that kingdom was going to look like. So when Jesus comes and he's in Galilee and he begins to sit down and teach as we begin the fifth chapter, he sat down as a rabbi would sit down and gather his disciples around him, and there was a crowd around that, and they were hearing what he said on this hillside. He begins to proclaim, here's the new kingdom. Here's the new king. You can be a part of that kingdom. But you must understand, we're going to start from the beginning, you, if you want to be a part of that king kingdom, aren't there just simply because of your last name or the clan you came from or which descendant of, of, uh, of, of the tribe of Judah or the tribe of Benjamin or the tribe of Dan or the, any of the other tribes, Napoli, any of the other 12 tribes of the sons of Israel or sons of Jacob that you, that you are. That doesn't just automatically bring you into the kingdom. You must deal with sin, the Beatitudes. Blessed are those. Okay. So we've been through that. So today, we begin with verse 13. And we're only, this, is, this is something that, that doesn't sound right, but Matthew 5, 13 through 7. I think it's 13 through 17. Yeah. I think so. I think so too. Yeah, I think so too. So we'll 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 pass through that. So our first session is going to deal with after the Beatitudes come the similitudes. Big word, just this is going to look at the outward appearance. The Beatitudes deal with the inward requirements of the citizen. Now the similitudes are going to deal with the outward testimony of the inward change. The inward citizen is going to reflect something. And this is what they're going to reflect. 
We're citizens of the United States. Without getting too far fetched. <laughs> what does a citizen of the United States look like to someone who's not a citizen? I know we have a pretty bad reputation. A lot of countries look upon, citizens from other countries look upon us with a lot of disdain because we're so flamboyant, we're so free with our money, and we're so speak like we want to speak, and we say what we're going to say, and, you know, they, but what do we really project? Spoiled children. Spoiled children. Spoiled children, okay. Why are we spoiled? Why do, why do we act like that? What do spoiled children, that's a good idea. What do, what do spoiled children do? They don't mind very well. They are usually pretty rambunctious. They whine when they don't get what they want, that kind of thing. Well, what do you think freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom to, to bear arms, freedom to vote, freedom to freedom, freedom, freedom gives self-expression. Self-expression yields, I'm not afraid to say what I believe. I'm not afraid to say what, what I want. I'm not afraid to, uh, to do that. And, and so we tend to take that to an extreme. And other people see that extreme as, well, uh, it's not good. But it's an outcry and an outcropping of what we have as citizens of this country. We don't see ourselves as having restraints. We are. We see ourselves. <coughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to paint anything as super good or super bad. It's just how do other people view us? Why do they want to come here? Why do they want to come here if they see us that way? If they see us in all of these negative aspects that we see portrayed to us, why do they want to come here? Because they want to be the same way. They want to see the same things. They want to have the same opportunities. They want to have, why did we grow as an immigrant repopulated country with so many people wanting to come here? Why didn't they want to go to South Africa? Mm. Why didn't they want that? Why didn't they want to go to Brazil? And some did. Why didn't they want to go to, because they had see in us, even though we act in flamboyant ways, things that they did not have. Now, take that basic concept and see what Christ is saying about his new kingdom. He's coming. He's got a new kingdom. He wants his citizens to have this inward yearning for what he can provide, and that's power over sin. He, he wants his new, his new citizens to realize that they have a hunger and thirst for righteousness. He wants them to realize that they have an enemy within them, and that's sin, and they must, they must mourn over that sin. They, they must they must seek mercy because of that sin. And sin is a root issue in, the, in what they've got to contend with as citizens. And when they contend with it through Christ their leader, who can forgive it, who can empower them to overcome it, who can empower them to be something else in this kingdom, then what does this kingdom need to see in them? Now we get to this. Now we get to this. If you have your Bibles, read with me. I gotta get to it. I didn't get it ahead of time. Alright, I don't want to do that. I want to do this. And those of you that are savvy will know that I am not savvy. There we go. He says to them in the 13th, chapter, 13th verse of the 5th chapter, still talking. Now remember what he's just told them. He's just told them about what the conditions are, what he wants to see inside the citizens of his country. Do you love your country? Do you what? Do you love your country? Yeah. Do I act like I love my country? 
Yes. Do I reflect that I love my country? He tells them, this is what you need to be. Then in 13, he, he wants them to, he's telling them what he wants them to act like. You are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost, has become tasteless, this is the New American Standard Version, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown down, out and trampled under foot of men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket. But on the lampstand, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This will help Lori realize that I'm a good tie to this class. We've got to sing those little ditties, okay? Uh, does anyone put a lamp on a, uh, light on a lamp and put it under a basket? But on a lampstand, it gives it oil to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. That's all we're going to talk about today. But it applies to us as individuals. It applies to us as a church. It applies to us as a community. It, apply, it applies to us as kingdom members in this world. That's what God expects us to be. So let's talk about this as we, uh, as we look at this because we're moving from we're moving from what he expects of us internally to what he expects of us externally. And that means he's going to be, and I'm going to use a word up here, Once Jesus established the expected character of the citizens in the new kingdom, he turns to the expected function of the citizens. What's our function? He says here that we're to, are expected to have an influence. Well, influence is an action word. Now, I can influence you by not saying anything. Most of you would like that. I can influence you by acting a certain way. I can even influence you by not acting. Just the very appearance of what I do or don't do can influence you. But the fact of the matter is, influence involves our, our impact on those around us. So what Jesus is talking about here is, I want you to come into my kingdom this new kingdom that I'm talking to you about, I'm presenting to you the messianic kingdom. I'm bringing that to you now. Here's what it is. Here's how you must act. And here's what I want others to see in you. There's a song like that. Here's what I want others to see in you. Why? So you can influence them, first of all. So that's going to be the issue there. Uh, I put in there that quote from John Dunn. No man is an island. So no Christian is by themselves. We are in the mix. We're a part of the mix. We're in the recipe of God's kingdom. That makes us individual, yet impactful to everybody else. How I act, what I do, what I say, as, as terrible as it may be, as poor as it may be, has an impact on you. So I have to be mindful of who I am and who I represent. I have to be mindful always about how it affects you. And by the same token, each of you have that same responsibility, whether it's in this class, it's just you and I talking, or if it's this church on top of this hill to this community. It has an impact on what happens. It spreads throughout. Why does the Bible often talk about, and why did the Jews dislike this thing called yeast? 
it was not, it, it was to be unleavened, okay? How many times did, did the Old Testament requirements and Jesus abide by those requirements? <coughs> We're talking about don't put any leaven in the bread. Don't put any yeast in the bread. What does bread do? Right. Makes, it Makes it rise, doesn't it? I like those rolls that rise big and taste good. Oh my good. You guys just had some donuts in here. That's some yeast in it, right? Do you want that in there? What does yeast represent? Sin. Sin. And so the attitudes was a way of dealing with and keeping sin at bay, at, at, at down, getting rid of it. And here he's going to talk about here's what I want this unleavened citizen to represent to all around. So influence is a big deal. That's our purpose. God didn't put me on here to make me happy. He put me here to influence everyone I come in contact with. Everyone. We had visitors today. You know who they are? We had two people come in here today. You know who they are? Shame on us. <laughs> it's all fingers point to Jim. Shame on us. We had we had our we had an opportunity to have a first influence today. First impact. What's your what's your first impression? We had two visitors come in there. Shame on us. We've already failed the test today. Start with me. There shouldn't be anybody come into this church, much less how we impact somebody outside this church. Much less where they see us in the grocery store or how we work with them. I, I spent years in a stinker field. I'm a tinker field. Uh, I spent years up there. Like, we know how that is. What does he say? No man's an idol. We're in it. He talks about salt and the juice, and he's going to talk about light and its value. Both are, are scriptural references to the people of this, to the people that's here in Christ talk about talk right now. They understand two critically important conditions that they dealt with in their life. One was internal, one was external. Internal was salt. So let's talk about salt for a second. There's passages, I've got passages of scripture there for you to go and look up and, and, uh, and, and see. In verse 13, he talks about salt. You. You is one of those pronouns that has a, has a double meaning. The, the, the you there, talking to his disciples, they're beginning to learn what it means to be a disciple. It takes time to learn to be a Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. That, that's, well, not look at Peter, Paul. It takes time to learn what all that means. So there's a, there's a learning teaching process going on. But these are also our citizens out here. This, this group, they're citizens too. They have the same requirement. These folks are being taught so they'll go teach others. These folks are hearing it so they can go teach others. Because we're all disciples. But these were going to be the 12 he was going to base his church on. So that you there is the implication of its individual and its group. We call it a church. That's fine. All right? Your salt and light. What was salt? Salt. Funny thing. Translated from Greek word theon. T H E O in just about any of the, of the Roman Greco languages refers to a godly or divine. Salt was divine. Okay? It had great value. What is something that's divine? It has a great importance, it's of great value. Salt had great value. You know they even paid Roman soldiers in salt? That was part of their pay. It was so valuable, so hard to come by, and so significant in its use that it had more value than a coin. Friends, 
Kleenex in here. I'm about to, my nose is going to drip and I, you know, <laughs> all that salt someplace. And I don't have a handkerchief in my pocket. So handkerchiefs have great value. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You know, it keeps yeah. you off being really embarrassed. Jim. Yeah. Jim. Yeah. Yes. Oh, <laughs> oh nice. Oh, you are so bad. <laughs> Glory over there. Take Some it. things we don't share. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to get the sharing speech from the child uh -huh. teacher. Okay. We have an ice cream. Yeah. Chuck, <laughs> appreciating that. What's? <laughs> give me some uses for salt. What do we use salt for? In it. Start. Flavoring. Huh? Flavoring. Flavoring. Good. Preservation of food. Preservation of food. What else? To make ice cream. <laughs> okay, what does it do? It melts ice. It makes things cold, doesn't it? All right. <coughs> you ever use it as disinfectant? Did you ever use it as, as something to, to fight infection? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Preserves? Preserves. Yeah. <clears throat> Occurs naturally. Kind of. The salt we know is primarily a chemical compound. Where did they get salt? The Dead Sea. The Dead Sea. How'd they get it? Oh. <laughs> Why is there salt in the Dead Sea? Get it. Just couldn't get it up. <laughs> they just they did because it, Dead Sea has no no way to flow out, so it sits there and acts as an and as, a, as an evaporation pond, deep, big. But still that, as it rose, it would spread out. As it dried up, it would leave a salt residue. Understand then, we have mines that have salt in it, based on ancient reservoirs of seawater. It comes from the sea. Did you know there are ponds now in this area, in the, in the uh, Middle East, that they flow, they, they've had channels. If you can see pictures of it, I wish I had the computer. We'd go out there and go Google some stuff, but we're not gonna put it there. Wrong. But they would have, as the tide would come up, water would flow into evaporation ponds, I'll call them, bogs, basically. As the tide would go back out, the heat of the summer, the rent would evaporate the water and would have salt left over, and they would gather it up. Bad thing about it is salt that they're used to seeing, and they were they were around the they were around the Sea of Galilee. They were close to the Mediterranean. They understood this process. They understood the value of salt, so this was very common to them. But the salt of that day had the same uses to bring out flavor, to preserve, to heal. But it had other minerals and stuff in it. So it makes it what he's about to say really important that salt could lose its value. It was critically important to have it for all of its uses, but it could lose its value. Can you live without salt? I mean, we get restricted from it, but can you live without it? You're required. You're, did you know, you're, you're medically required to have a certain amount of salt in your system. You get too much. Uh, some of you have been in the service. You used to have to take salt tablets. Anybody ever play football or anything like that and have to take salt tablets? Why would you take salt tablets? You don't make salt tablets, right? Because you get dehydrated. One of the advantages of salt causes you to have a thirst, right? To seek. What's one of the Beatitudes requirements that uses the word thirst in it? We just spent six weeks studying this now. Okay? Hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus tells them he wants them to have salt. You are the salt that you will hunger and thirst. Create a thirst. I want you to hang on to that idea because we're going to see something else when it comes to light about that. But do you have a thirst for God's Word? 
you have a thirst to share God's word? Do you have a, a hungry, a desire that has to be met through that? That's what he's wanting them to have. That's what he's wanting them to see. But he's going to say something here. He's going to say, if I can get this to turn the right way, uh, you are the salt of the earth. So therefore, if you're the salt of the earth, look at the characteristics you have. You can preserve the word. You can create a thirst for the word. You can add flavor to the word. To the kingdom. Those are all things that you can do to have an influence. All right? And he says, but it's, what happens if, if the salt becomes tasteless? Now, in their culture, salt that they got from their normal means, from the Dead Sea, from these evaporating ponds, and they would, it would have gypsum in it, or it would have other minerals. Well, when that salt part of it was was gone or, or lost its, its flavoring capabilities, what was left was putrid. Mm -hmm. All right. Rex was telling me this morning, she remembers when they used to write, wipe, wreck uh, your hams and stuff in salt, hang them up and, and, and smoke them, and that would preserve them, and so that preservation was there. Well, when salt lost its <clears throat> capacity to them, it became worthless, but it was still had a form. It didn't all dissolve and go away. It still had gypsum stone in it. It still had other minerals in it. And so it becomes valuable for what? Throwing it down on your path and walking on it. Yeah, like Jim, a gravel. Yes. I was listening to a teacher that was teaching on this. This has been a while, so I'll have to repeat this, but he said that as they were touring Israel, they came upon um, this group that was cooking bread in the ground. And when they, the fire would go out, they would take the salt and put it down in the ground where they were cooking, and it would flare up because it's full of magnesium. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so Jesus was probably teaching in that area, and so he was using the way they cook as an example. And mm -hmm. so it's the fire and then the salt has lost its flavor. Yeah, and they would be very familiar with those kind of characteristics. They <laughs> that it was not valuable at all at that point. So he's saying to the members of his kingdom that he's setting up. Yeah, now let's understand what this means. He's fixing to go into some very detailed touchy subjects in this <coughs> because these folks are used to hundreds of years of teaching from the rabbis from the prophets of what this kingdom was going to be like and it was going to be a kingdom of laws and it was going to be a kingdom of strength and it was going to be a kingdom of influence and here, here Jesus is talking about I want you to be a I want you to be a member of this kingdom, and here these are the characteristics you're going to have, and these are the influences you're going to have. But if you lose your influence, you're worthless. You're like the salt that's lost its flavoring capacity or its preservation capacity, and good for nothing but just throwing it on the ground and using it like gravel. So that's what he's saying. It was used. It was used to bind things. It was used to uh, to uh, uh, preserve things. So I, I put a quote in here from John MacArthur. I liked it. Christians are a preserving influence in the world. They retard moral and spiritual spoilage. Without a moral compass, my word without a, a, a spiritual objective, but we we get spoiled. And I'm not talking about spoiled like a child. 
I'm talking about spoiled like rotten, spoiled like decay, <clears throat> spoiled like of no value. And that becomes an influence in and of itself. And we, we, we are to we're to buy that. So I, I ask a, a question down there. When you walk into a room, does the moral and spiritual atmosphere change? When you walk into the room, does the moral and spiritual atmosphere change? Okay. See how I work with people in the shops. And we're having a break area. And I walk into that room. Does anybody quit cussing? Mm. Does it even impact them? Does anybody start worrying about what should I say or what should I not say? Mm -hmm. Did I just embarrass myself? Or do I walk into that break room and say, hey, there's an old carver and that very old son of a... <laughs> um, and Chuck would say that, see? He, he would look at that and say, those are my words exactly. Does it change the world when we go out in it? Does it change this class? Does our presence here make a difference? Well, I, I haven't heard anybody tell any of her jokes. I haven't heard anybody cuss. I haven't heard anybody, do, you know, I haven't heard talk about. So, uh, yeah, I think our class has changed, but are we being emboldened? Are we being encouraged? Are we being uh, supported to even be better? To be more influential for Christ? I hope so. But I want us all of us. I don't want any, I don't want any, I don't need any personal testimony here. But when you walk into a room, what's your influence on that room? Now, granted, we want. I personally want to see people happy, so I end up telling jokes or making, trying to make people laugh. I like to do that, and then sometimes I carry that way too far. <laughs> I hurt people. I've, I've hurt people's feelings badly. Oh, you sure have. Yes, I have. Ah. <laughs> I but but yeah, you, you can carry down on over there. I, you can carry those things too far, and I do. I know that. Mm -hmm. I understand that. There have been times I've had to call people and apologize for. I I went too far. I carried a joke too far. Chuck, you waiting on him to apologize? <laughs> no, it ain't gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> but what happens if we walk into the room and we have no influence? What happens when we walk in the room and nobody notices a difference? What happens if we walk into hair salon, barbershop, dental office, you know, anything, and, and they hear something else? Or they see something else? Are we different than the world? And Jesus is saying, I want my followers who have these internal characteristics of the Beatitudes and recognize sin do that, I want them to be a member of my kingdom and in, as a member of my kingdom, when they walk into the world, what's that last Beatitude we studied? What was the last thing? The result of those, those eight blessings? What was the last thing that happened to them? The last question we... Those that are like this will be persecuted. That's the last verse of the, of the Beatitudes. And he spends three verses on just that point. If you, if you absorb these blessings that are there for you as, as, you're, as you're dealing with sin, you will be persecuted. When you walk into that room, the world's not going to like you. The world's not going to like you. We come here to encourage one another. We come in here to help one another because we all have to go out there. Now, he's coming in and he says, he says that, that this, is, this is something we're going to have to deal with. There's some scripture up there for you. 
So what can what can go wrong? It can lose its, its we can it, it can lose its uh, savor or flavor. All right. It can't and it can't be restored. And, and so we know now that salt that was that could not be didn't have a way to be restored was just discarded. You had to go get more salt if you wanted those kinds of characteristics to take place. So that, that didn't happen. It just made it repulsive. So if it's worth nothing and you can throw it away, then what, what's the lesson? Well, I put it up there. If the believer fails to live and function as outlined in the Beatitudes, his testimony, his testimony, that's the outward appearance of the inward living, becomes tasteless, rejected, and unproductive. That's against providing flavor, uh, you know, preserving. Those are the opposite things. Tasteless, rejected, and unproductive. We cannot stimulate. And then those are some of the things of the uh, Beatitudes. Humility, purity, thirst, hunger, etc. It's a lost world if we've lost our own hunger and thirsting for righteousness. We don't have a hunger and thirsting for righteousness. There it is. I don't know. The contrast to that is found out in this 14th and 16th verse. That, uh, that 14th verse comes out. And he says, You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. What's, what's that say? What did they see? They're on a hill right now. Jesus is talking to them. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. What In their mind, what did they see? Well, they saw the city, I suppose. Sure. Now, how could you tell it was a city? Light. Light. Why? Why wouldn't it be a farm? No, it was a city. You're right. Yeah. Where Where did they have the lights? If you had a city, you had more houses. If you had more houses, you had more, not candles, oil burning lamps. Okay? Uh, there's where you would have light. We've all been outside. We all, you know, we well, got the stars, the moon, and then you can see a, you can see a candle a long way off. You don't have to have a really bright, bright light. You can see a candle, and on the darkest of nights, or where there's no stars or anything out, and it's pitch black. I was going to turn the light off in here, but this doesn't help much, okay? Because because if I do that, then I come up here and do this. I'll get it here in a second. You know, that's not much, but you can sure tell where it is. Now, if I ask all of you to take your phones and do that, don't, please don't. We're, we're going to stop this. We all know what the thing is. We do it, We you do it with the little ones. You, you have this light. Well, we're to let our light shine. If I walk into the room and everybody's in the dark, but I have the light of Christ within me, guess what? It should, you one, you'll be focused on it. Two, you should want to come and investigate. You should want to come and see what that light is about. What it's, what is it doing? Well, let's look at that. Light then reflects a display. What do we teach? What do we preach? What are we? What are we? So. It's an outward thing, not an inward thing. It's positive. It reveals what's wrong and false and helps produce what is... What's the thing they always say? Light reveals, darkness conceals. My son thought he was really smart. He'd turn out the lights, he'd go to bed. And his friends would be parked out on the road. <laughs> With the lights out, we couldn't see him sneaking out the window. Of course, any good parent knows you have a sixth sense about it. It got real quiet in there. wonder what he's up to. <laughs> oh, yeah, the guy's waiting for him out there in the car hid behind the pine tree out there. They can't figure out that. One, you got to turn the radio off in the car. That doesn't help any. You know, I'd say, and if they're lighting up a cigarette, well, that's just like a sending the signal. You know, there's somebody out there. So, you know, then I go in and flip on the light switch, and he's half in and out of the window. Where are you going? It's only 
six feet down, you're going to fall and break your neck. By the way, you're not going anywhere. Light reveals, reveals what we are, what we do, and it's a reflection. Now, to them, the best way for this probably to be described is they knew the source of light to be the sun. They rose in the morning as the sun came up because they could see, and they went to bed at night when the sun went down because that was the end of it. They set their clocks by that. They used their timing by that. The rising of the sun, the setting of the sun, the hour of the day, all had to do with what the sun was. Well, what happens? 28 days of the year, well, no, that's not true. 20, 20 days a year, I'll say that. You don't have any nighttime light except for stars. But then you got this thing called the moon. Did it have, we know now what the moon does. I don't, I'm not sure they all understood completely what the moon did. But what does the moon do? Does it have a high, is it a, a light source? It reflects light. It what? Reflects. It reflects light. Christ is saying he's the light. We're the reflection of him. You know the sun. He is the source. Jesus is God made man incarnate. So Jesus is the sun. We are to be the moon. We're to be the reflection in the darkness of what the world has become. And the idea of, well, you know, what does a moth do when it sees light at night? Why is it that I turn on my porch light and it just a gazillion bugs come? You know, it draws the light. They can't help it. They come to the light. We all have had those little electric things that kills them, you know, the little bug zappers, and yeah, kind of like my grandkids used to like to go out there and watch them. Get zapped. So be zapped. Okay. Well, that's what he's getting at here. Take the attitudes and the internal convictions and the things that take place to be a citizen and apply them as the preservative and the food enhancers and the creators of a thirst as salt and let them see me through you. You are the light of the world. And it can't be hidden. And that's the thing that I think that we as Christians have to really think about here. If we walk into that room, they may not be able to tell how much preservative we've got in us. They may not be able to see how much flavor is there or what kind of flavor can be tapped to be, to be enhanced. But they can tell by our action, by our smile, we don't have to say a word, that there's something I'm interested in. I'm drawn to that. Now, the world will be drawn to it. That doesn't mean the world will accept it. That doesn't mean everybody that comes is going to be uh, going to be responsive to it. But they can see it. It's that sitting on a hill. You cannot deny it's there because you can see it in the darkness. I can tell by your life and what you do in your life where you are. Because you're reflecting the light of Christ. So what we have here is we have Jesus taking the, the and it's critical to understand the Sermon on the Mount. That's why we're, we spent a whole, whole hour on just these four verses. Because they tie directly into the physical, internal, emotional, conscientious decisions and and our, our relationship with sin 
and what we what we want to do about it in the Beatitudes to what we are and how we reflect Christ, the forgiver of sins, the one that's more powerful than sins. The ones that have the one that has an answer for sin, the one that is sinless, we reflect him. And that's what he wants his citizens to become. So what we have then as we get into the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is going to be this is how I want you to act. And here's a whole set of conditions. Here's a whole set of issues. Here's a whole set of things that, that you are going to have to unlearn. Because they have been under the under the, the, the heavy foot of the, of the rabbis, of the prophets, of the teachers. Over 400 years since there's been a prophet. 400 years, longer than we've been a nation. This group of people, the Jews, did not have a prophet, did not have a, a, a spiritual leader. They didn't have a word from God. 400 years, now think about that. We can't even last four years before we start crawling back in our hole <laughs> or believing everything that's put out there for us. We, 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 sh we can't put that together for that length of time. So how far how far have these people gone from the last prophet, Malachi, To where they are now. This is why this teaching from Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount is so critically important because everything he's going to do in his ministry after that is either going to reinforce it or he's going to come back to particular issues in it. If we understand the Sermon on the Mount, then we understand what three, year, three plus years of Jesus' ministry is going to be about. He's going to confront sin. He's going to confront attitudes. He's going to confront people. He's going to confront actions. He's going to front, confront authority time and time and time again to back up and support his claims he's making in these three chapters. But it all begins with who's the citizen and how's that citizen going to act? What are they going to portray? So, we have this and again, I gave you uh, you understand that. So what's the challenge? Light must be visible in order to illuminate. Like a city set on a hill, it cannot be hidden. We must be exposed to others so, uh, so others can readily see us in what God has imposed on us. We must be exposed. I'm sorry, you can't hide Christ. You cannot be a closet Christian. And I'm not trying to be funny about that, okay? You can't be a closet Christian. We must understand that we're going to be exposed. Why? So others can see what God has imposed in us, empowered within us. Some are going to reject it. Some are going to persecute. Some are going to laugh. Some are going to exclude. Some are going to discriminate. Some are going to... Uh, totally reject anything we are and not want us anywhere around. And when we enter the room, they're gonna they're gonna let their venom be displayed. Others may be drawn to it. And we have to be prepared to share what we have. So so this whole condition is where we now are when he starts talking about and you've been taught this, but I say this. You've been led this way, but I say this. You've been, and he's going to start tearing down everything they have been taught and accustomed to and rebuild 
into what his kingdom will be. Some of you have been in the military. First thing basic training does, you don't know anything, you can't know anything, you're not supposed to know anything, you're not supposed to act anyway, you don't know your right foot from your left, and we're going to start from the beginning, and we're going to build you back up, so get rid of it. Your mama ain't here to help you anymore. <laughs> All right? That's, that's the way, that's what they do. They rebuild you into what they want you to do and how they want you to act and how you respond to the commands. And Jesus is in a, in a terribly bad comparison. Jesus is the drill sergeant that's going to whip us into shape and tell us what's acceptable in God's service. And that's, that's, that's where this goes. So, what's, what's the last verse? We're, and we're through. The last verse then is going to come out. I, I did it this way because I thought it would be easier. And, and it's not. It, it turned out to be not so good. Anyway. Now, we're to see the good, the works in us, and we're to glorify and praise God. The, the, the point of that last verse is it's good works to the thing that saves us. It's the result of all of this condition that, that Jesus has set on, this, on the requirements of the citizens of the kingdom is going to produce shining lights, good works that others may see what you're doing. Why? Folks, we don't do anything if we're not glorifying God. It's worthless if we can't Glorify God. The word right there, the oxazo, is to praise God. So, that's the purpose of this, is, is the, the citizens of this kingdom will do good works, not because I'm commanding you. You're going to do it because you've got a change of heart. It's what you're going to inwardly want to do through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're going to inwardly want to do and your outwardly expression of that is through your praise and worship of God. And we come together <coughs> to do that in corporately. We come together to help and encourage one another to do that. Comments, questions? Anybody got anything you want to say? Lori, did you take some notes? I didn't tell me to. Yeah. <laughs> I told her to bring the book. <laughs> that just, that's my pumpkin. <laughs> that's Those are my pumpkins. Those are your pumpkins? Uh-huh. Okay. Remember we carved them in? Right. They have the light. First one's a heart. represents Jesus. Yeah. The, the cross. And the other one is we put the light in the heart. It's showing that Jesus is in our heart. You just explain my pumpkins. <laughs> <laughs> that way, way. She did that in, in, in 30 seconds with a pumpkin. <laughs> yeah, with a pumpkin. <laughs> and, and I rambled on for an hour. <laughs> Let's have a word for it. Good. Father, once again, we just thank you.